This is a video about post-operative management of blood glucose in adults with diabetes and stress hyperglycemia. This video will review the clinical significance of post-operative hyperglycemia. This video is for medical professionals caring for post-operative adult patients with diabetes or stress hyperglycemia on surgical wards. This is an educational video intended for healthcare providers and is not meant to replace clinical judgment. This video will teach you the difference between type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and stress hyperglycemia, why it is important to treat hyperglycemia in postoperative adult patients. This presentation does not apply to patients in intensive care, patients with post-transplant diabetes, patients on high doses of steroids, patients receiving total parenteral nutrition or enteral tube feeds. Diabetes is a heterogeneous metabolic disorder characterized by the presence of hyperglycemia due to the impairment of insulin secretion, defective insulin action, or both. The chronic hyperglycemia of diabetes is associated with relatively specific long-term microvascular complications affecting the eyes, kidneys, and nerves, as well as an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Broadly speaking, there are two types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes results from the permanent autoimmune destruction of insulin-producing beta cells in the pancreas, leading to a complete lack of insulin in the body. This is called absolute insulin deficiency. Therefore, people living with type 1 diabetes must always take insulin. Of all the diabetes cases, 10% or less are from type 1 diabetes. While the pancreas can make and secrete insulin in type 2 diabetes, the cells in the body cannot use it as well. This is called insulin resistance. As a result, people with type 2 diabetes are often treated with non-insulin-based medications although, over time, some will also need insulin. Of all the diabetes cases, 90% or more are from type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition that commences with genetic susceptibility and environmental triggers, leading to chronic inflammation of the insulin-producing beta cells in the islets of Langerhans of the pancreas. The environmental stimuli that trigger beta cell damage are poorly understood and may include viral infections, early exposure to cow's milk during infancy, and even vitamin D deficiency. This pre-symptomatic phase of type 1 diabetes may last many years, although autoantibodies to pancreatic antigens can often be detected. Hyperglycemia only develops when the functional mass of beta cells declines below 20 to 15 percent of baseline. Ultimately, absolute insulin deficiency ensues, and this can lead to diabetic ketoacidosis. Consequently, people with type 1 diabetes must always take insulin. Type 1 diabetes is often, but not always, diagnosed earlier in life. Those living with type 1 diabetes must self-administer insulin either subcutaneously at least four times a day or via a continuous insulin pump. Those living with type 1 diabetes rarely take oral medications for their blood sugars. Important. Hospitalized patients with type 1 diabetes always require insulin, even when they are not eating. Without insulin, patients with type 1 diabetes may develop diabetic ketoacidosis. Type 2 diabetes develops as a result of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is when muscles, fat, and liver cells do not respond well to insulin made by the body and cannot easily take up glucose from the blood. As a result of insulin resistance, the pancreas has to work harder to make more insulin. As long as the pancreas can produce enough insulin, blood glucose levels will remain normal. However, the pancreas cannot keep up with the increased demands from insulin resistance and insulin production eventually falls. Relative insulin deficiency occurs as a result. Relative insulin deficiency is when the pancreas cannot make enough insulin to maintain normal blood sugars in an insulin-resistant environment. Since the body still makes insulin during this phase, those with type 2 diabetes often use oral or non-insulin injectable medications that improve insulin sensitivity or increase 
the body's insulin production. As type 2 diabetes progresses, insulin production falls even further, which may lead to absolute insulin deficiency. People with type 2 diabetes are often, but not always, diagnosed later in life. People with type 2 diabetes may take oral agents, insulin, or both. Type 2 diabetes is often, but not always, associated with central obesity because this is the most common cause of insulin resistance. There is another type of dysglycemia that is important in the postoperative setting, stress hyperglycemia. Stress hyperglycemia refers to the hyperglycemia that develops in those without pre-existing diabetes due to the physiologic stress of surgery. Stress hyperglycemia may be a harbinger of type 2 diabetes. Up to 60% of people with stress hyperglycemia will develop type 2 diabetes within one year. People with stress hyperglycemia may have risk factors for diabetes, but have not been diagnosed with diabetes before their admission. Stress hyperglycemia is discovered postoperatively. Hyperglycemia from pre-existing diabetes, or stress hyperglycemia, has been reported in up to 40% of patients undergoing general surgery. Whatever the cause, it is important to properly treat hyperglycemia in postoperative patients. This is because postoperative hyperglycemia is associated with an increased risk of prolonged hospital stay, postoperative infections such as surgical site infections, pneumonia and urinary tract infections, thromboembolic events, cardiovascular complications, and renal insufficiency. In general surgery, the incidence of surgical site infections in patients with diabetes is approximately 11% compared to 5% in patients without diabetes. Surgical patients with glucose levels greater than 12 millimoles per liter are approximately 12 times more likely to develop a surgical site infection compared to those with glucose levels less than 6.1 millimoles per liter. Recognizing and managing postoperative hyperglycemia improves patient outcomes. And so it is important to understand how the different medications work. This topic will be covered in the next video. Hopefully this video has taught you the difference between type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and stress hyperglycemia, why it is important to treat hyperglycemia in the postoperative adult patient.